For too many years, families of children with devastating illnesses have felt helpless as they watched their child suffer. Today, they're taking matters into their own hands and finally finding relief, treating their child with cannabis. These are their stories. Welcome to another episode of Love Love and Cannabis. Cannabis. I am Nina Simmons. And I am Osiris Steffen. And we are the proud parents of Aiden Aiden Steffen. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to another episode. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, guys. I want to thank you all for uh, tuning in again and want to also introduce a guest tonight, um, someone I met about a few years ago. Um, during a trade show in New York, and uh, we all stayed in contact. Well, he's a fellow New Yorker now, and uh, it's it's going to be a good one for tonight. Uh, his name is David Hess. Um, he's with Tresk Capital, the president of Tresk Capital, an investment firm in New York. Uh, he comes to us by way of California. Ooh, ooh. A, yeah, a transplant. Nice. Welcome. <laughs> coast to coast guy. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. So, Thank you for having me. No problem. So how, how do you like being in New York versus California? Because yeah. I know beaches is it's, different. <laughs> it's different. I'll tell you, it's it's very different. And uh, although it's, you know, it's nice this time of year, um, I, I my heart's still in L.A., I got to be honest. Uh, my... Uh, my my family's still out there. So oh. pre-COVID, I, I would say I was there almost every month or every other month. If wow. it wasn't for uh, for business, then it was some kind of family celebration. And uh, like I said, my siblings are out there, and my wife's from LA, and mm. and so all her siblings are out there. My my oldest is now in college out there, oh, wow. and uh, so unfortunately, it, it seems like we're we're going to be stuck. In New York a little bit longer because of COVID, but uh, you know, but I, I do hear planes roaring overhead every so often. I'm not too far from from JFK. I'm I'm kind of right by Long Beach, uh, the other Long Beach, Long Beach, New York. So uh, I, I still get my fix in, uh, you know, to, to go to the beach when when the weather's nice out here. But uh, yeah, you know, right right not too far from JFK. So. It's nice to to hear the roar of those those engines. It, it gives me hope that I'll be able to get back to to LA soon. Oh, yeah! I find that a lot of people that are transplants from California, they come here for maybe a different experience, but their heart is always back in Cali. I noticed that. Yeah, I'll tell you, I came here. I was I was diagnosed with cancer, mm-hmm. and um, I had looked into. Uh, dozens of oncologists. It was synovial sarcoma. So it was kind of rare. Mm. And um, I was 20 years old and, um, you know, whole life ahead of me. And it was one oncologist, one oncologist at Sloan Kettering that said, yes, nah, I, I've seen this before. Come on out and uh, we'll take care of you. I don't think you're going to die. And once I heard that, I said, okay, I'm in because everybody else was just trying to make me comfortable and people talking about different hospices. And so as soon as they said, we can take care of you and Sloan Kettering's got a great reputation, um, you know, it was out on the East Coast and didn't have any family uh, out East. But, um, you know, I I jumped on a plane and, uh, yeah, I've been here since. So. It's uh, like you said, came here for other reasons, but my heart is definitely still still out west. Can you, um, sh- if you don't mind sharing with the listeners um, the, the type of cancer you had? Um, I know you yeah, said absolutely. Is, I kind of describe it. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was crazy. So um, synovial sarcoma and typically that presents in maybe like the thigh area and it will grow to the size of like a softball before anybody even notices it. it grows really quick and it metastasizes to the lungs wow. almost immediately and so that's why there aren't too many survivors uh, of, of synovial sarcoma and when i had it i had it sitting on a nerve under my foot so imagine if like you're it's in plantar fascia Yes. area but if you're if you're standing on your foot it's like right in the middle you know you, you, if 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 you, 
you're standing on it and it's pushing up against the nerve, trust me, you know something's there. It's like it's got like a, a rock, you know, like in your shoe or something. Like you know something's there. And so that's what it was for me. I mean, and I would go to podiatrist after podiatrist and they would try telling me it was bone spurs mm -hmm. or anything, you know, plantar fasciitis, anything but cancer. I mean, that was the furthest thing that they were thinking. And luckily for me, I had an uncle at um, in Philadelphia, actually, that was a radiologist. And he told me after about a year, he said, how come no one's giving you a scan, you know, an MRI? And I said, I, what do I know? I said, you know, and I actually started going back and asking for MRIs. And they said, no, you don't need an MRI. You don't need that. We're just going to give you this shot, that shot. Uh, because you're and age, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I gave it to, so my uncle finally says, you know, just, just come out to my hospital in Philadelphia and we'll do an MRI, you know, immediately. So that's exactly what I did. And within, I remember a, a couple days, you know, they called me, they had sent the, uh, they had sent the biopsy actually off to uh, Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came back as cancerous. And they sent it to Walter Reed because I remember him telling me, he's like, there's no way that you've got cancer. We found this something, but there's no way. And, and uh, but yeah, they, they sent it out to Walter Reed and it came back. It was cancerous. And uh, even though it was in such a strange place for it to be, it was miraculous because it was still small enough. It didn't have a chance to grow to that softball size where uh, it didn't metastasize, fortunately, and uh, it stayed local. Wow. And uh, at that point, that's, he's the one that said, you know, you know go to Sloan Kettering. Um, you know, again, I was looking to stay local and I had all these other oncologists, but, um, you know, he, he was able to get me into Sloan Kettering. And then once I spoke to that oncologist and then again, he told me that he could save me, um, you know, that, that was uh, music to my ears. Of course. The, the major challenge came for me though, uh, my second battle within just within my second year anniversary of being cancer free, it came back. I had that similar feeling in my foot where I just couldn't stand for more than like, I don't know, 30 to 60 seconds without feeling like, you know, super sharp pain. And it was very familiar pain and went back to the oncologist and said it's back. And uh, we took some more scans. Sure enough, it, there was a local recurrence and I ended up after that surgery and, you know, doing chemo and after my second round of chemo, they, you know, they basically suggested I remain an inpatient for the majority of that year because wow. I was getting such bad reactions to the chemo. And so even after they would send me home, I would just get neutropenic and wow. end up back in the hospital with her and to a nosebleed that just wouldn't stop or just something, uh, you know, high fever. I would just be right back in the hospital, you know, within 48 hours, you know, so they would just basically say, you know what, just stay here. And so I, while I was in Sloan Kettering, uh, again, I'm from LA. And in fact, back in 96, when, when right, actually in 95, when I was a senior in high school, uh, the, I was getting signatures for prop 215, uh, because it was cool. I wasn't the, the biggest activist in the world, but as a senior in high school, there's not too many other, uh, part-time jobs that are that are cooler than that and so i didn't have a stigma really to, to cannabis my family didn't have a stigma to cannabis oh, nice. we were part of uh legacy cultivation operations as well back in california and so you know having access to cannabis and 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 being around cannabis wasn't an issue when i was going through uh, my cancer treatment but that that uh time at sloan kettering where i was inpatient i wasn't it got to the point i wasn't able to get out of bed I mean, it was so bad. Um, I remember just wanting to just stop. And I, I said to my oncologist one day, I said, are you killing me with this chemo? And he said to me, he said, well, we're taking you to the brink of death, but you know, you did sign off on that. And I said, well, I remember signing all those papers and I remember us having that conversation, but I didn't think you were serious. And I believe you now, you know, and if I could take it back, let's take it back. I, I want to stop. And luckily, right before I quit, someone gives me an article on Marinol. And I hand this uh, 
article right in, in Time magazine to, to my oncologist defiantly saying, here, if I can, you know, get Marinol, if you can prescribe me this cannabis in a pill, basically, mm -hmm. I'll stay. And they look at me and they said, you know what, we've, we've never prescribed it uh, to anyone here yet, but there's, it's, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, sure. Let's, let's oh, find a wow. pharmacy that has it. And, uh, you know, they've got a pharmacy in house at Sloan Kettering, but they didn't stock Marinol at that point. And so there was one pharmacy in Manhattan that had it. And when they got me Marinol, I remember I was back to my old self. I was telling <laughs> jokes. I was having friends come by to watch Monday night football and, and making sure they brought wings, you know, and, and these friends were looking at me like, how are we looking at the same person? You were on your deathbed a few days ago. And I said, I, I, nothing's changed other than Marinol. So as far as I know, I'm still on my deathbed, but I'm okay with that, you know? <laughs> and what happened was, is, and, and, you know, we're learning today whether or not that had any kind of apoptosis, you know, uh, you know, actual death of the cancer cells as a result, maybe, maybe not. But what we do know is, at least anecdotally, is that it allowed me to continue on with my chemo and with, with their protocol. And I was eating again and I was feeling, yes. you know, good again, which we know psychologically, emotionally, you know, going through chemo doesn't take, take its toll on the body. It takes its toll emotionally big time. I was always somebody that, and still am somebody that likes to be a giver, likes to be a helper, likes to be someone that contributes, you know, to others and to society. And, and being in a hospital bed, you can't do any of those things. In fact, you're quite the opposite. You're just on the receiving end and, and taking uh, mostly, and it's very uncomfortable. And so having Marinol in my system and, and, you know, again, because I couldn't medicate with any other form of cannabis. And luckily for me, the Marinol did have e efficacy. I'm sure some people in your audience are, are thinking to themselves, didn't I read that Marinol doesn't have efficacy and doesn't really work? Well, it worked for me. So it does work for some people and others it doesn't. It's, it's like most cannabis these, you know, these days, it's, it's still trial and error. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but it worked for me. And, um, you know, I, it, it sparked a passion in me. You know, I had roommates at Sloan Kettering. I was on a pediatric floor because my cancer was a pediatric cancer. I'm, I'm sitting there with her sleeping rather with in my, as roommates with you know, five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. And unfortunately, plural, right? They're, they were moving on, unfortunately, to, you know, to heaven. They weren't, they weren't going home, right? And I'm saying to myself, how is this possible? How am I still here? right? Number one. And number two, why am I watching Cheech and Chong? And why am I watching, you know, having munchies? Why am I watching <laughs> Monday Night Football? Why am I like enjoying my was... time here? And these kids, <laughs> you know, my roommates are, are suffering. Like what's going on? And I just wanted to understand what medical cannabis meant. And it was a paradigm shift because to me, again, it's coming, coming from California and really you know, having a pretty good understanding of, of the legacy cannabis uh, industry or cannabis, you know, community. We understood what medical laws meant. It, it meant keeping us out of jail or, you know, if you were if you were lucky, right, because they were right. still and, and still are, uh, you know, putting people away. But it was a way for us to do things, you know, as legally as we could. Right. Exactly. But yes. here I was in the, as, a, as a as a, you know, cancer patient going from I, I wasn't eating, right, and I wasn't laughing, that's for sure, to, to eating wings and, and, and telling jokes again. And it was like it, it, the only thing different was cannabis, you know, synthetic, not synthetic. Again, we're going to learn. We can have that debate. <laughs> you know, it, it worked for me. Um, I believe there are two distinct tracks. You know, there is a medical track. There is a a, an adult use track, they're both fine. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to find that products, you know, and, and molecules are from, from the plant are better for, for other track, you know, for, for one's better for, for the pharma side and, and the medical side, and, and one's better for the uh, adult use recreational side. Um, but one thing's for sure, cannabis is all good. You know what I mean? And and it helps people and it helps adults and it helps children. And, um, 
it, it, it's it's a shame that you know that that it became politicized mm. and it's a shame that you know it was it, you know cannabis and and not just thc but you know it's it's it, it's it's cousin the hemp plant right became became you know, got penalized for it as well and as a result uh society lost right i mean it wasn't just you know, patience, but, you know, it, it, we now have, have, you know, the amount of, of, of waste, you know, and, and plastic, um, you know, that, that's filling our ocean, you know, I see a future where, where, you know, that goes away because of hemp, right? Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing the light and I'm glad that uh, I'm, I could play, you know, a small role in this in this cannabis industry in this cannabis economy um but most importantly um you know my passion is really helping patients understand helping people understand that cannabis it, it's it's okay to talk about it, it's yes. a plant and and there's nothing wrong with it people don't overdose on cannabis but they sure overdose on opiates and other meds that you know were being fed by by mainstream you know medicine today um, so it's important to have the conversation and, and i'm really thankful that we're having it uh today what is i mean what a story wow Thank you. can you explain to the listeners um you know some some of our listeners are they know a lot about cannabis and some are, are curious, so that's why they're listening. Can you just um, explain what Marinol is versus, you know, CBD? Mm -hmm. So, they, can, so can, Marinol is, it's made in a lab, mm -hmm. right? And it is, it is a single molecule. It's THC. Mm -hmm. So it's the THC yes. isolate, but it's man-made, right? It's synthetic. And so um, it's, some people will argue that for cannabis to have an effect uh, on for to have its true medicinal effect, there has to be an entourage effect, which mm. would mean that all the the cannabis molecules and, and cannabinoids and flavonoids and terpenes and 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 all that good stuff are presented uh, at once. And I'm sure that there's you know a lot of truth to that. Um, but I believe that in certain cases. Um, you don't. Absolutely. Uh, and I've seen I agree. Marinol <laughs> I agree. And, and another form of Marinol is Dronabinol, uh, mm -hmm. same, same thing, uh, just different name, um, are, are prescribed today uh, in hospitals around the world, uh, not just for cancer, uh, but for, uh, for, other, for AIDS patients um, mm -hmm. and other patients that need an appetite um, or for patients that are suffering from depression. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really, it, it's miraculous what, what it can do on those, uh, you know, both for the appetite and both, like I said, for someone's emotional stability. And we're going to learn. I mean, we, we couldn't learn because, you know, in, in the United States, uh, the government didn't allow, uh, didn't allow the research to, to, to take place if it was for positive research right but we're going to to learn now whether or not like i said there was actually any medicinal benefit on the side of of uh, killing the cancer what we've mm. seen in from from some research in israel for example is that certain strains of cannabis can actually cause cancer cells to to uh for the cancer cells to cause suicide in yeah, a sense aptos, that's what aptos used, is, yeah. is to cut off the blood supply to mm -hmm. itself and uh so it's almost ironic right i felt i was sort of committing suicide because of the chemo that that i was taking uh and here it might have been that the the cannabis that i was taking had the exact opposite effect and was you know wow. causing the cancer to commit suicide but how cool would that be wow <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, it, it's it's uh, it, it really is uh, you know it, it's an amazing amazing plant that um, you know so so again it, it, it's synthetic um, there there's room for synthetics uh, in mm -hmm. cannabis it's it's a lot it, it's less expensive it takes it takes less time to produce uh, and we can produce uh, singular 
um, singular cannabinoids that way as well. And in a pharma type environment where, you know, in Western medicine, we're very accustomed to having very specific doses, yes. right, yes. Of, of, an, <laughs> yes. of ingredient. Um, whereas, you know, Eastern medicine philosophy, that wasn't the case. And it doesn't mean one's any better or one's any worse. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know if, if uh, we're going to retrain Western medicine to, to think a different way or to, to go back to thinking uh, the way, you know, they used to prior to, to dosing. But, you know, the only way to truly get there is likely going to be through synthetic. Um, that said, there's still so much pharmacological, you know, uh, use and, and efficacy uh, from cannabinoids from the plant. It's just going to be a lot more difficult to have consistency that way. Um, so th yeah. I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of benefit when, when used in tandem, um, mm, which we're, we're that's starting a good to see idea. as well. That's a good idea. That's mm -hmm. a good idea. I didn't even think about it like that, to use it in tandem. So if you do need something maybe for the entourage effect, but then you, exactly. the doctors would feel a bit more comfortable dosing something that's consistent so they can kind of know, you know, what everything is coming from. Interesting. Exactly. Exactly. That, that was one of the issues we were having with our son was making sure we got consistent product. I mean, we would purchase an oil. Uh, it would work for a month. Then the following month when we're ready to refill, it, it doesn't have the same effect. Now, you know, the seizures is an uptick. And when we contact the company and say, hey, look, there's, what's going on? It seems like my son's having more seizures. It's a string. He goes, we said, did anything change? Oh, well, you know, you were getting one particular strain. We ran out of that strain, so now we wow. had to use a different strain. It's like, you can't do that because we kind of count on you mm -hmm. like it's a mm -hmm. medicine, even though we're able to order it, not need to get a prescription. So there's a fine line now with that because yes. – as a company that's just producing oils and selling them online, if a family's dependent on it because it's cost effective to a certain extent, cost effective in a certain extent without a prescription, then you would have to be consistent. Because if not, you're forcing the FDA to relook at everything and say, uh, you know what? You guys can't really sell this for medical use. Or if people exactly. cannot be using it for medical use. Yeah, like, you know, uh, you know, especially serious conditions such as epilepsy, epilepsy yeah. you know, so we did, exactly. we did run into that. And, you know, the plant itself, it's a plant. So, yeah. like, when you grow strawberries, not every strawberry is the same size. You know, it's going to be Unless a you're Monsanto. Unless you're Monsanto. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. One big strawberry. And That's it. <laughs> it. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, so tell me. How did you form Trust Capital with Asher? Like, how did you guys meet? Yeah, so great question. So back in, so, okay, so as I mentioned, right, I, I, my, my passion was sparked and, and I wanted to do everything I could to further the credibility of, you know, cannabis, the legitimacy of this cannabis plant. And I mean, Anybody I could speak with, I, I, I would. So I was reaching out to um, everybody that, I, you know, that, that had ever done any research or written a paper on cannabis that I could find on the Internet. I was finding out their contact info and reaching out to Alan Shackelford, Bonnie Goldstein, Rafi Mishulam in Israel. I mean, everybody, right? Bill Levine, everybody. And uh, everybody was, was very gracious um, and, and would take time and, and point me in the right direction and, 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 and show me where I could learn what I was looking to learn. And uh, sure enough, in, in 2010, six licenses are awarded in Jersey. Mm. And the cultivation manager tapped for that, for, for that, uh, for that job calls me one day and says, the the two ladies that had that had been awarded the the license have brought a couple of groups in that that were supposed to bring the capital and and for one reason or another that it, it didn't happen and i'm pretty sure that you can bring in the capital a b you can help me with the operations because we can bring out the network from from california and c um you know haven't you been talking about you know wanting to 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 bring forth this 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 new industry and and really push 
cannabis legitimacy forward and 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 this is your chance dave and that's exactly what i did i i brought in um a, a partner that had experience in believe it or not in, in in creating nuclear isotopes for mri and uh so he did have the the background the medical you know clean room background uh that requ would be required to build out this type of infrastructure really under the noses of you know the pharmaceutical industry in new jersey and understanding that in a decade you know which is actually now right from that point this is what would be most likely looked at as as how to cultivate right not um which was an automated uh clean room facility essentially right and, and not you know what you were seeing back at you know in 2010 which was more like you know scaled up basement rows if that makes sense right if you if you went out to colorado or, or some other places early you know in this uh you know early in this new cannabis economy that's what you were seeing rarely would you see uh anything you know technologically advanced and so that's that's what i wanted to do and that's what i wanted to build so probably spent a little too much money and and spent a little too much time doing it but we built it out and um to this day it's really been an example for for a lot of the industry on the east coast um and uh so it's, it's a great facility um and um when when that was built and and completed i had quite a few high net worth friends uh, and colleagues that wanted to invest in similar uh, in similar operations or just you know invest in the cannabis industry and they trusted me and were ready to invest you know with with whatever my next project was going to be and so I started going out to you know this is now what like 2011 or so so you mentioned uh where we met at, at a conference so in 2011 that's when the conferences were really just getting off the ground right mm -hmm. some of these conferences today you know you'll you'll have you know 10,000 plus right and some of the bigger ones 30,000 plus right yeah. early there were maybe you know if you had 300 people at, at an event you were happy and so you'd have to think, right? I mean, how if you're if you're someone like me, which is sort of like a natural networker, I, I'm a people person. You know, 300 people, it's, it's uh, you know not that difficult to to you know get through the room. Yeah. And so I was sort of growing with the nucleus of the industry because I was going to all these conferences, I was joining all the associations, all the industries, um, industry associations rather. And uh, I remember after one trip to uh, Arizona. Uh, after looking at a, at a cultivation, I had uh, a friend of mine was uh, uh, an investment banker, and he says to me, he says, what's going on? And I said, you know, I'm looking at all these great deals. And he says, yeah, why, why aren't you doing any of them? And I said, you know, I don't really have a finance background. And if I'm going to start putting millions of dollars uh, to work of, you know, of really, you know, friends money, um, I wanted to ensure that, you know, I'd be able to do it responsibly. And to me, that meant bringing in a partner that, that uh, you know, really had a finance background. And so he said, you know, I recommend you, you meet uh, this guy, Asher. Uh, he is somebody that is, uh, you know, is an impact investor, right? And I'm like, what is an impact investor? He's like, he likes, you know, to if he's going to make an investment, he wants to do it. Um, not just for the bottom line, but he wants to ensure that it's having a greater in impact on society and, and, and the greater good, you know? Um, and so I said, great, let's, let's meet. And, um, he shared my vision of wanting a, to make an impact and, and me for me, you know, that was certainly on the, on the, uh, credibility side of cannabis, obviously, but, and, and on the, you know, sure, I, I, I would love to one day see cancer, you know, be eradicated as a result of cannabis. Um, but, you know, my main goal has always been to, you know, it, like I said, it's it, the cannabis plant is all good, right? And so what that means for an industry, especially in the beginning is, is support. And, and it's not just on the pharma side, it's, it's, whatever is happening, right? So at first right now, it's, you know, especially in California, it's infrastructure and ensuring that that's, that the legs of the industry are supported. And he shared that vision. 
Uh, and, and thirdly, he wanted to uh, see that this were like any other investment firm for any other sector, for any other industry, right? And that we're going to treat this, you know, talking about cannabis, dealing with cannabis, no differently than, than any other commodity or, 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 again, any other industry. And uh, that's what we built. And, and, you know, he brought this, you know, institutional style uh, you know, to, you know, to the, to the cannabis industry, um, you know, and, uh, you know, with, with my network already being, you know, again, part of that, you know, a, 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 you know, knowing a lot of people and, uh, that were already part of the legacy industry in California, what I was, you know, especially early on and, and still today is sort of a bridge between the two worlds, right? Because you have to imagine, a lot of the Wall Street guys coming in, and, and maybe some still are, view that legacy industry mm-hmm. not in the kindest of light, right? And to say it nicely. <laughs> and, and, and on the other side, right, you've got a lot of legacy market not wanting, you know, these Wall Street guys to come in that know nothing about cannabis and, and don't appreciate what, you know, mm-hmm. you know, decades and decades of, you know, of, uh, advocacy and, 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 and passion, you know, for, for the plant that, that a lot of people have had before them and, and didn't necessarily respect that road. Um, you know, that they were, you had investment going back and forth between those groups. Right. Yeah. And that was a recipe for disaster. And I saw that, you know, very early on. And I said, all right, this is going to be my, my place in this industry. I'm going to be the bridge between these two sides because there are a lot of great people, um, you know, that already exist in this industry that need support. And there are a lot of good people to come that need support. And there are a lot of great investors, right, that, that have a lot to offer that aren't going to, you know, they're, they're not going to get a fair shake and vice versa, right? So I want to make sure – as best as I can, that, that, you know, I, I paired up the capital with the right opportunities, right. And able to take my family's capital and just expand on that with, 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 like I said, with, with this group of high net worth individuals, um, that trusted me with their capital, um, you know, to, to really invest it the right way and, and, and set an example for other investors, um, you know, that, that, uh, that want to invest in the industry um, and, and are like-minded that, that want to make a greater impact. And, and, and this way, it, it's not just about, you know, the bottom line and, and especially, you know, early on in the industry, that's needed because especially if you're investing on the private side, like we are, you're not looking for liquidity, right? Within any time soon, period, right? I mean, you're not expecting uh, that kind of a return. But what we are expecting is the impact, right? We are measuring the impact. And what we do love seeing is, you know, when, when our operators are able to give back to their communities or when they do have hiring policies where we see the equality, we see the diversity at the sea level um, and, 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 and support that. We, you know, and, and, or, or we're, you know, making investments into companies um, you know, that are tracking the waste, you know, that, that the industry is creating and not, not to point out in, in a negative way, but to, to highlight it and then say, okay, how can we, how can we make this better? Right. And, 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 um, you know, or, or, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we, we operate, as I say, on this, you know, limited social license in this industry, but, um, the amount of energy that it can take, you know, some of the state's force cultivators to grow indoors, right? Um, and, and especially on the East Coast, right? Uh, and maybe that's needed because you can't grow outdoors, right? But if you can't cross state lines, right, we're not going to get it from the West Coast where it probably should be grown outdoors. And then, you know, consumers and, and patients don't have to pay these exorbitant costs, right? But if you're growing indoors and you're, 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 we're consuming all this energy to, to grow the plant a very specific way indoors, well, that, that can be very wasteful. And granted, now we're, we're seeing LEDs and, 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 and that's one way to, to mitigate the amount of energy that's being used. Um, 
but you know we're, we're also seeing um, you know many other platforms like Ronetics, which is in our portfolio, yeah. um, you know that that's helping cultivators really grow and 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 maximize their efficiency and 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 keep their energy down and and ensure that they're able to grow at maximum sustainability um while you know of course getting the yield that that they need in you know as the operator in order to succeed as as, as an operator in the space and and pay the, the taxes that they've got to pay so um you know it's uh it's it's the support um, you know, for that infrastructure that that we're here for, um, that that will really further the industry. You know, if, if that makes sense. That it does. That's what that's what I'm here for. And so, yeah, that's you know, it's, it's a little bit of a long answer, but Asher really brings in um, that financial background. That okay. that uh, you know, he was he was on Wall Street for over a decade before he uh, you know before we met. And uh, officially, that's Tress. He's, his last name is Tropy. I'm um, Hess, so oh. we get Tress. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and and it's, uh, it's easy, right? In the dot-com world, you want to keep it as short as possible. So True. Tress True. is great, you know? Oh, that's awesome. So let me ask a question this. As it relates to CBD mm-hmm. in New York, which has been, hasn't been clear. I don't think CBD is clear, period. But, you know, people are heavily involved in it. I, do you have a CBD company that's in your portfolio and how do you see it playing out in the East Coast in the, uh, yeah. the CBD industry? So we do. Okay. So we have, I mean, so we have companies, I'll give you an example, like, um, like Infusion Biosciences. Infusion Biosciences has an extraction technique, an IP really, that, that they discovered over 30 years ago when they were producing a very specific cholesterol medicine from a lipid and from a plant that was like cannabis, a lipid, a fat that needed to be bioavailable in human beings, which are made mostly of water, right? Uh, So that doesn't work. And that's why we were talking earlier, right? That's why uh, a lot of times emulsifiers are brought into the equation or, you know, there's nano emulsification involved. There, there's nano encapsulation, I'm sorry, involved. There's some way to, to take the, the lipid and make it, you know, polar, make it uh, bioavailable. And Infusion Biosciences came to me, I would say at this point, almost four years ago and said, we don't know what we have here, <laughs> but we've got this bottle uh, that we, you know, we've extracted, you know, this tincture that we extracted using this, this IP. And we think that it is strain specific. And we think that you are going to feel it in under two minutes and that it will be out of your system in an hour. Okay. And this works for, for, you know, if it were a, again, it's strain specific. So if it's a plant that is high in THC, it'll be a high THC tincture. If it is a, uh, you know, a, a, an ACDC plant, for example, right. Or any other that is a, a high, um, CBD, low THC plant. Well, that's what you'll get in the, in the, uh, in the extract. It is, there is no post-production involved. There is no nano encapsulation. Um, and it is uh, no emulsification involved whatsoever. Um, and, that's exactly what happened. I felt it within two minutes of taking it. And within about an hour, I, I, I wanted more, right, to, to get rid of whatever was ailing me. And I had uh, other people around me uh, try it out as well. One example would be an uncle of mine that was also going through chemo. And he unfortunately was having a lot of like mucus associated with it as a reaction and would just be carrying around a box of Kleenex wherever he goes. And so I said, here, take a little of this and, uh, you know, some orange juice or whatever. So gave him a couple drops and immediately no tissues. And 45 minutes later to an hour later, boom, tissue box. And I said, let me give you a couple more drops. Give him a couple more drops, takes the drink. Again, no tissues for another hour. And I'm doing this over and over again. I said, well, it worked for me. It worked for him. It worked for another guy that has a migraine. It worked for the other guy that's got Crohn's. This works, right? And and again, with 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 no you know 
emulsification and and some of the issues that you know somehow like you know I think we were talking about offline whether it's you know a different type of um, yeah, you know uh, sunflower oil or, or, or other agents that they're having to you know ingredients that they're having to to mix uh, into the tincture uh, you don't need that. Uh, with with an infusion biosciences product, and so it's taken a number of years now to uh, you know to understand the science behind it. I mean, it was for me, it was one of those where you know I pushed the golden button on that one. It was a game changer. I still believe it is probably one of the biggest game changers um, that is that I've come across in in, in a period in my history with cannabis, and and I've been around cannabis. A long time now. Um, it's something this approachable. Uh, it just doesn't exist outside of infusion biosenses. I mean, I've seen a number of tinctures that you know have a challenge with taste, have a challenge with shelf life, and as I said, have a challenge with ingredients and what those ingredients do um, for the patient. Uh, and even sometimes, you know, how it is. Um, you know how it is um, metabolized, right? If and and there was actually a warning. There's, still, there's a warning with with GW and Epidiolex. When you take too much CBD, um, depending on what medication a patient is taking, uh, it, it affects their CYP450 uh, and how they how how they metabolize. Period. Right. Yes. Um, and once those enzymes, if, if you mess with those enzymes, it well, if you're taking if if, if a patient is taking a, a, a medication that requires those enzymes to sort of be that final ingredient, right? Which a lot of times that's how medicines are made. They're made it with that in mind that, that the CYP450 enzymes are going to react. And then that's how, right? That's, that's how the medicine, uh, you know, um, becomes bioavailable in our bodies. Uh, but if you're taking too much CBD, it's a CYP450 inhibitor. And so, uh, that that could be challenging for some patients, and so, boom, checks that box, right? And so I, again, it, it, I've never seen anything like it. And so we pushed that golden buzzer. It, it was early in that, and that again, we just now figuring out, um, you know, how to, uh, you know, how to get it into the hands of consumers. But um, we'll be seeing that very shortly uh, on the THC side in California. Uh, and in Washington state and then uh, on the CBD side everywhere, because fortunately uh, CBD from, you know, from the hemp plant, you know, can cross state lines. And so they can make products specifically um, with certain strains. So for example, Osiris or Nina, if your son, you know, has, has, you know, success with a very specific, um, uh, formulation, you you know, we could help you get that formulation tested, right? And you say, okay, it's from that specific strain. So, you know, all right, for whatever reason, uh, Girl Scout cookies, I made up a strain, right? Mm -hmm. Girl Scout cookies has this specific formulation. Well, now a lab like SC Labs, which, you know, where one of was one of our first investments, uh, you know, could, we could understand what exactly, uh, um, is, what is the profile, right? Because yes. the name is not really going to help us, right? Because they could grow Girl Scout cookie, uh, you know, um, at the farm next door, or forget the farm; it could be the same farm, and and it's just in in the plant, <laughs> the one plant over, and it's going to have a slightly different, uh, slightly different, uh, you know, makeup, right? If you put it under the microscope, under the GPLC, so it is. It's it's important to understand what the profile is. We'll we'll we'll, we'll get that, and then you can, you know, you can have that going forward if you know it's coming from a specific, uh, you know, CBD hemp strain. You know that can cross state lines, right? And if it's extracted this way, well then, um, you know, you get all the benefits from that strain without having to reintroduce anything. Period. Um, so to answer you, so it, it's not a CBD, uh, CPG company, um, that we have an investment in, but it is a company that is going to provide the ingredients to, uh, hopefully many CPG companies out there, uh, very, very soon. Um, That's and great. then on, we have, uh, we have a media company called Cannabis Now. And what we did with Cannabis Now is after about 10 years of Cannabis Now, 
being uh, in publication. Uh, they started uh, in 2010 out of Berkeley. They, uh, they, they did what Elle magazine did. Elle magazine started Elle Decor, right? And that's for their readers to go pick up uh, you know, furniture or, or whatever they're seeing out of L, uh, go find it L decor. Well, we wanted to do the same thing with cannabis. Now we wanted, um, we wanted the, the 4 million plus followers that, that, uh, you know, we're reading cannabis now to be able to find what they're reading about and getting excited about. And so we opened a CBD wellness store in Los Angeles, right uh, right where, where LA and Beverly Hills converge. Um, and, uh, we built a, a 4,000 square foot, like I said, CBD wellness store, uh, and education center where, where patients and, and customers can come in and understand what is limiting, what is, you know, so what, what are the terpenes, right? What, what is pine? What is myrcene? What's linalool and, and what kind of effects do they have? And they can smell it using we had true terpenes had the terpene wall in there and they were really experiential right um and and can understand which cbd product was great for them or their pet you know and 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 why right and and if it was a cosmetic they were looking for or or, or uh you know some um you know or clothing you know made from hemp uh they could find it at at the cbd wellness store cannabis now's wellness store in LA, unfortunately, uh, it was looted on on May 30th uh, during during the, the first day of protests for, wow, for George I'm Floyd. So sorry. Um, wow. Yeah, it was. It's a crazy, crazy story. And so, um, yeah, we we were looted. Uh, it took it took about you know an hour or two uh, to destroy you know months and months worth of work, but uh, we're just just reopening now um and it's obviously for for pickup uh you know curbside pickup now that you know california la in particular is still a, a hot spot for covid <laughs> we're just getting nailed left and right but but we're we're you know we're Jesus. resilient right so we're going to keep pushing um but you know to answer so we do have sources for cbd in the portfolio uh it's not a cpg company itself but it's a home for CBD, right? For CBD patients, for CBD brands to tell their story. And that's what cannabis now is. So, which is really in line with how we make investments. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be, you know, multi-tiered. It's not just, it's going to have those ripples, you know, that, that really branch out into helping others. And it's, you know, it's, it's one plus one equals 10, you know, not, not two. Attention Cannabis Podcast listeners, you can now listen to your favorite cannabis podcast ad-free with the MJ Bulls mobile app. Just download the free MJ Bulls mobile app to your smartphone to start enjoying cannabis podcasts with no commercials. Go to Apple Apps or Google Play to get the MJ Bulls Cannabis Podcast app today. Just to ask you on this point, uh, thinking like as a futurist in this industry, where do you see the next big market? Like, I mean, because I know that California is the one that really started it off. And then now somewhat the East Coast. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if it even has to even really taken off yet, the East Coast. I don't even think that's really. But where do you see the next moves that are going to happen? Like where it's going to be like, okay, cannabis is definitely here to stay. And or as well or as hump, hemp and for that yeah. matter. I'm ho I'm hoping that it's New York. I I I'm seeing all the signs, you know, the the writings on the wall, as they say. They they've lost now seven billion plus in tax revenue uh, due to COVID, and with the amount of tax revenue cannabis can bring in, I mean, they they've hit a billion dollars in places like Illinois, California, and other big states, and they'll do it in New York in no time. Um, and, and over time it'll multiply and, you know, the tax dollars go, go to the school systems and, and to, to, to the homeless and all these great, you know, community programs. And, uh, that's been part of the holdup in New York, um, is, you know, 
figuring out a the social equity program yeah. um, and b you know where the taxes are, are going to be spent. Um, but I, I think they're they're almost ready to you know make some announcements. I'm very hopeful uh, that that they're going to come up with a system that you know maybe looks closer to an Illinois. And I mean they haven't gotten it perfect either, um, but it's been one of the smoother rollouts of the states uh, in recent years uh, that we've seen. I don't think any state has gotten it perfect yet. Um, and I, I'm not a believer, you know, some, some believe, you know, if you, if you don't get it perfect the first time, mm -hmm. it's so hard to change. So just don't put a program out. Um, and, and I hear that philosophy, um, but there are just so many great things that, that also happen once you start putting, um, you know, putting a legal framework into play. Uh, I mean, just the amount of jobs alone, it, we're hitting, you know, 300,000 cannabis jobs. I mean, that's more than computer programmers. Yes, I mean, true. who would have thought that, right? It's amazing. Um, but that's real, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's real. If you think about it, I mean, how many computer programmers do you know out there? Lots of them, right? And then there are more people working in cannabis. I mean, it's a real, op you know, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. for, you know, for people to make an honest living yeah. and feel good about it and help others. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what background a person comes from. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a home for them uh, in cannabis. And uh, especially for entrepreneurs, uh, now's the time to, to, to really push forward. Uh, it's an industry that um, is supportive of, uh, you know, of entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, it, it's a good time to, to be in the industry right now. Oh, okay. So I think that I think New York. I think New York is uh, is 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 next. Okay, well, let me ask you because I know you've been, like you stated you've been in the industry for quite some time. Do you see the is there is this? I mean, you probably know the answer to this question, or you may not. Is there a diversity issue in this industry? Because I hear it a lot, and I do see it. I do see it. Yes. One hundred percent. Okay. There's, I think the number is like four ish percent, um, where you've got non white, uh, as non male white, right. As, mm -hmm. as at the sea level period. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we're, you know, and, and this is actually, you know, a, a good time to do it. We're we're looking to hire right now. We're looking to hire an invest in, investor relations uh, person, mm -hmm. and we put a call out. And I'm so frustrated because I, I I said to Asha the other day, I said, you know, why am I seeing, you know, men, you know, and and white men, honestly, right? Uh, I want to see I want to see some more diversity here in, in the applications that you're sending over. And he's like, Dave. 85 90 percent of the applications that are coming through are white males and it's frustrating it's frustrating for me as somebody that wants to hire and that wants to um you know that 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 wants to um you know enable right um for a diverse workplace a for for trust but but to, to push that forward in the industry so i think we need to encourage um you know, encourage more people uh, of all shapes, colors, sizes to yeah. to be okay with cannabis. I mean, you know, if you think about it, right? There might be um, there might be reluctance also, right, from certain people from certain backgrounds to 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 join. Uh, you know, to join the cannabis industry right now, maybe because for so long they've been persecuted, right? Absolutely. And and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and maybe you're thinking, is this a trick? I don't know. You know, yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe yeah. maybe not coming out. I don't know. But we try to do. You know, I mean, like I said, SC Labs for us. You know, CEO uh, we is black. Um, Jeff Gray is an amazing CEO for SC Labs, and does it push the needle? I mean, it. it a, a little right and 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 i'd like to see more of it and and for infusion biosciences the ceo is is indian american um and again does it push the needle are all of our ceos non-white no and it's not by design right but 
I would love to see more Eugenio Garcia, non-white um, CEO of Cannabis Now. Um, and it, it's, you know, it, it wasn't by design. It was, you know, it was, um, but, but we love that that is what shows up uh, almost, be, you know, even that it was not by design. I mean, it just kind of says sort of who we are as press. You know, we are, you know, colorblind. We're culture blind. I mean, um, we want we want you to have to be in this for the right reasons for cannabis. Yeah. And that's what we see. We see, you know, uh, we see green, but different kind of green, you know, people were yeah. usually for the money, <laughs> you know, we're seeing cannabis, you know, the cannabis plant. And that's, that's what we see. And, but, but yeah, I, I am, you know, I, I actually spent a lot of time trying to encourage diversity, um, not just in cannabis, but in the, in the leadership within cannabis. Right. right? And, and, and being vocal about your leadership. And, and when I do see those leaders, you know, I, I love giving that, helping them have a voice. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that is, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, um, you know, webinars were, were a part of nowadays that we can't go to the conferences when, when it was conferences and now webinars, you know, trying to promote uh, equality and diversity um, and, and showcase that in our industry, I think is, is helpful. And I, and I, and I try and do that, but I think it's also just, you know, telling the story and, 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 uh, encouraging everybody to, to, you know, sort of place their brick in, in this, you know, industry and building this industry and, um, understanding that, that that's that that's what this is about and and not to be worried um and are there are there people in this industry that you know aren't as uh, open-minded or like-minded i'm sure uh, but i personally know of many that are and uh, are very welcoming in the space and um i'm hopeful that that you know we keep doing our part as press and uh keep making sure we associate with, with the right people. And I think ultimately we will begin to push that needle uh, and see better representation, um, you know, from all cultures um, in cannabis. I mean, that's, that's really what this plant is, is, is about. It's one of the greatest things that it teaches us aside from the medicinal benefits. I've always said that, you know, other than maybe music or, you know, a good meal, Cannabis is one of those things that, that can bring people with different backgrounds, different cultures, different political beliefs, Agreed. you know, religious beliefs together, you know, at a table and, and laugh and, and, and enjoy each other's company. Why? Because they're enjoying cannabis together. Um, and cannabis can do that not just, you know, um, you know, as, uh, you know, on, on emotionally, but, but, but can also provide that you know that that even playing field for for everybody and i think that's something unique really to to cannabis that this industry offers yeah we've noticed that with us as a, uh, my wife and i in that it empowered us to make certain decisions to take control of our son's <laughs> well-being and not to have it a one-sided conversation when we go to his doctor's appointments it's a conversation that we're both having so it's not a matter of you know, we'll take what the doctor says and go home. No, it's no, it's, we're coming to them and sharing with them what we're experiencing and what we have in mind and how can they help us. So that's one it. of the things I did appreciate about the plan. It empowered us to, you know, take, you know, hold of ourselves and our families um, and hearing your story. And that's what it's done for you. And look where it's taken you. So that's awesome. Now, my last question for you, this is going to be an interesting one because um, we see it happening. And I think you may have an idea where I'm going with this. How do you see blockchain playing a role in the hemp and cannabis industry? Good question. So <laughs> from what I've been hearing, right, through the grapevine, right, over, over maybe the last year or two with blockchain and cannabis is that it's too early. Not that it's the wrong platform, right, or part of the platform, but it's too early in that you know, there are too many unknowns in blockchain right now. And that on top of too many unknowns in cannabis is is too much to handle. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we haven't seen the 
acceptance that we might have thought we'd be seeing, especially, um, you know, in a in a compliance heavy, regulatory heavy industry, non banked industry as cannabis, you would think that this is the obvious home for blockchain. Um, but yeah, the reluctance uh, over the over the past few years has really been as a result of, of just almost too many uncertainties that, that are yet to be you know written in cannabis. And I think once they iron those things out, then uh, we'll be ready for blockchain. I, I believe we'll, it, it, almost like LEDs, right? LEDs now in, in a cultivation, it's like everyone's using LED, yeah. right? But three, four years ago, everybody was saying, you know what? It, it's too early. We're just trying to get our, we're just trying to That's get true. dialed in. We just need to get up. We don't care what we, we just need to get up and running. Uh, and LEDs aren't proven yet, but now it's, every, you know, almost everybody's using LED. I think, you know, fast forward, you know, five, Six years from now, you know everybody will 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 be using blockchain. So it, it's just a timing thing. Yeah. Uh, versus will it or will it not be here? Got it, it. It'll be here. Wow! I can't wait. Well, David, yep. thank you very much for sharing your your you know your passion with uh, with the plan and also what it's done for you and changing your life uh, for the better and keeping you healthy and safe. And uh, now that you're in the the investment aspect of it and you investing in companies that are also doing great things in the industry. I would say thank you. Helping people. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to you and, you know, apply for that job. <laughs> yeah, definitely. How would they reach, reach out? Yeah. Either uh, can find us on LinkedIn uh, or go to our website, uh, www.tresscapital.com. They can also go to Tress dot i o uh, if that's easier um but uh yeah trustcapital.com uh, or on linkedin uh, you'll find me directly and um go ahead and follow uh, if you're on the website you'll you'll be able to find out uh, how to apply and i uh, look forward to uh, or you can also email me uh, d hess at trust capital.com dhess at trustcapital.com and uh please re- you know send those resumes in and uh i'd love to hear from from anybody that's looking uh to do some investment relations awesome nice. awesome thank you very much thank again you david so much for sharing yes definitely tell asher we said hello and i hope to see you guys soon i mean we uh, once this thing is over we can do lunch <laughs> absolutely absolutely you know cyrus thank you so much and uh thank you for both of you for for what you're doing for for our industry and and helping people as well definitely that's, that's what this whole industry is about it's helping right exactly exactly all right david thank you again and take care and we'll talk soon absolutely have a good one you too, you too. buddy bye-bye right, bye-bye thanks for tuning in another episode of love and cannabis I'm Osiris Stephens. And I'm Nina Simmons. Be strong. And stay empowered.